world has changed. America has changed. If something were to happen tomorrow... How self-sufficient would you be? Could you grow your own food? Could you sustain your own livestock? Could you survive? This is the We Grow Our Show with Nick and Don. Nick and Don talk about everything from politics to planting. They cover techniques, methods, and tips on how to not only survive, but thrive. Visit the website at WeGrowHours.com. Lock and load. This is the We Grow Our Show. Get your grow on. Get your grow on. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Welcome back to the We Grow Our Show. This is going to be a good week. We've got a lot of news. Uh, we've got a really good guest. That's right. We've got Justin Rohner with us today. He is the owner of Agriscape. And uh, for those of you that don't know, it is the new twist on how to grow food in your yard without making it look like a garden. Yeah, and I got a chance to talk to Justin a little bit myself. I was, you know, he was telling me, wow, you you know, what he's doing, and we're going to learn about what he's doing. And I thought, my God, the work involved in this. And he was telling me, hey, you make money off of this, you pay somebody else to do that. And, and that changed my mind as well. And all right, I'm in, I'm in. And yeah. we'll get into the financials on that too. I want to ask Justin about, you know, he'll he'll talk to us about what he's producing per square foot. And some of the stuff that he's doing to do this to really integrate your home and your lifestyle into agriscaping. Yeah, that's you, – you talk about the added work. I really don't think that there's that much added work just because you have to garden anyways. You have to trim your trees. You have to mow your grass. You have to do all these things. Hell, you might as well eat it too. Yeah, eat it and sell it. There you go. So, yeah. Uh, what else do we got in store today? We got the plug of the week we'll be doing. Oh, yeah. I know what that is this time, too. We actually pre-planned this a little bit. Yeah, wow. yeah. Amazing. Now's the spot. Yeah. Look who's getting organized. <laughs> <laughs> it was next turn. I'm yeah, always organized. Shut up, Don. Yeah. Well, we we uh, also have some really exciting news for uh, listeners, and we're hoping to welcome a few more listeners here with APN Radio. Uh, we've been woot, – woot. Yeah, we're going to do a weekly show on PrepperBroadcasting.com. Still be able to hear us on iTunes and Stitcher, all the normal places at the We Grow Ours website, but we're going to be, you know, joining the ranks of some pretty dang good podcasters out there. I'm excited. Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy, and there, there's some really good gardening uh, links on the website. I, I, you know, go to prepperbroadcasting.com, take a look at it. You've got animal husbandry, you've got communication, what to do in disasters, food storage, gardening, medical and health, news, politics. Alternative power, which I know Nick, we're going to be oh, doing some shows yeah. on, you know, so a lot of stuff on fire. Mm. <laughs> they do live chats a lot of times too. A lot of their shows are live. Ours is going to be recorded and I don't know the exact date that we're going to be on, but we're really excited. So everybody that's listening, go check out APN radio, uh, prepperbroadcasting.com. We're excited to be part of this. So what else we got? I guess I have to explain why we didn't have a show last week. I think that would – and I could post the pictures too. Uh, yeah. So my truck and a truck in front of me kind of got into a little bit of a confrontation. See, he thought he should be stopped and mine thought it should just keep on going. Now, you weren't driving. There was a white rabbit, something. Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, – the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland was actually driving the truck, couldn't reach the pedals and stop in time. So I've got a picture of that we'll put up there. Uh, I don't know. He was on some kind of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Not the ones that make you big enough to drive, apparently. Uh, but you're okay. Well, as okay as I was before I got in the accident. I still have some brain issues. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that ahead of time. Uh, this is episode six, so if anybody didn't know that by now, I yeah, yeah I'll I, fill you in. Yeah. So we are glad you're okay, Nick. Um, the car, the, the hostile hair truck, not so much. Yeah. She kind of got pierced right through the radiator and feels like the power steering went out in it and everything. I mean, the whole front clip is just gone. So I had to go and buy another truck and a I bigger just, one. Yeah, I did. I added two cylinders to the engine and about three feet to the bed. So nice. She's a hunk. 
Yeah, you're going to put a big bumper on this for next time. That's right. I'm going to have a big old – I'm going to be the one giving damage instead of taking it. <laughs> <laughs> and and the and the new truck is going to be dressed up with the Hostel Hair oh, of course. logos of course. and everything, right? So when are we going to see that? Uh, as soon as I can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of that, on our website, we grow <laughs> Accepting uh, donations. <laughs> Nick sells some really good rabbit cages on there. Uh, the link is on there to his site. So yeah, we're running a just wrecked my truck special. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, another news story for this week uh, update to SB1151. That's right. We'll be talking about. That I believe last time we talked, it did make it through the Senate floor. Or did it- uh, you know, we missed a week here, so why don't you just bring it up to speed? All right. So, SB eleven fifty one is the Homegrown Freedom Act. Actually, the first part of what will be many uh, laws brought into fruition. So, first off, the sponsor of the bill, David Farnsworth, awesome guy. We we had Galen Luth write it up or tell Dave that there needed to be something done. From there, uh, they got together. They wrote up some pretty simple language to put it into the bill. It's gotten a lot of support, a lot of people wanting it. A few people that I will just say are ignorant uh, have tried to oppose it because they're afraid of getting feathers in their pool or, uh, oh, we can't deal with chickens in the morning and the noise they make. Well, you know what? Chickens really don't make that much noise. The dang crackles that are around here make more noise than chickens ever do and there's no law against them. Uh, but anyway, so the law was written to basically trump on the state level any laws put out by the municipalities of the townships that are limiting on chickens. Now, a town can say how many chickens are allowed, but they cannot forbid chickens. Yeah. Now, I'm a libertarian, Nick. Yes, sir. I believe that the local government trumps and then it moves up from there. Mm -hmm. And I know that's one of the objections in this bill. Yes. And it's actually one of the objections and probably the only valid objection that I actually see. Now, I've been able to overcome this. And so why don't you tell us why, you know, why this bill is important and how it is not trumping other people's freedoms? Mm -hmm. And, and what's your opinion on that? Well, that's, that's, that's good. In fact, if you guys know, the United States government was meant to just loosely hold the sovereign states together. Uh, it has become something much more than that where Big Brother basically holds on to all of the, all of the states and there's a lot of blanket policy that gets passed on the federal level that trickles down to the states and a lot of states' rights are going away. So I agree with you, Don. In most situations, you want the localized government to be in complete control. The problem is a small town like Chandler, Arizona, for example, they got pushed around and bullied by member or by owners of HOA or homeowners association. And not, not necessarily the residents. No, not the residents, just the, I'm sorry, but the a-holes that run them. Yeah. Uh, they think that they know what's best for the residents. So. They say, well, chickens are a bad thing. They lower property value. <laughs> and, and these people are not residents of these communities. They no. are hired law firms for the most part. Exactly. And that's kind of, and that's what swayed me is knowing and, and going out there and talking to some of these people. I am also believe in the constitution. There you uh, go. We have some rights under the constitution, even though they're, they're Just being limited every day. But again, this is not a political discussion in that area right now. We should do a full show on politics though. Yeah, see how many of our liberal friends we piss off with that one. <laughs> we can invite them along too. Anyway, this is it's a it's a issue that's saying that the local government can still remain in control. Yes. By limiting this. Yes. So it, they might limit it down to one or two chickens. Exactly. In a in a you know smaller area, mm-hmm. and we're also not talking about condos or apartments here. That's right. We're These talking about single, single family homes, detached family homes. Right. So if your house sits on 6,000 square feet or more, you will have the ability to have chickens. Right. So we're not talking about everybody has the ability to have chickens. There's no local ordinances that can prevent right. this. And again, local ordinances will still remain in effect and they will still like be valid. Smell, smell and, and noise, noise, nuisance, you know, all of that's going to be there. So to the people that are opposing this, just give that some thought, you know, uh, as far as the, the education and and I don't think Nick means by 
people are ignorant. I think um, any insult, I think it's legitimate. Some people are ignorant of having chickens. I know I was until I had them. We have 26 of them. They're quieter than than any of the, my neighbor's dogs. They yeah. go in at night and go to sleep. I don't even have to do anything. Yeah, they're, they're not a nighttime bird. No, what I'm saying is there's been some blatant attacks that just – ooze ignorance. I'm not talking about the people that are just wondering, oh, well, what about this and this and this? Right. I'm talking about people that have come out and proven that they're ignorant. And I know we're talking about this a lot on the show, but we are passionate about it. Yeah. Um, Nick has been leading uh, this movement and uh, along with others, but yeah. he's been involved in this movement and a leader in this movement here in Arizona for a while. So I'm not exactly the point of the arrow, but I'm definitely on the sharp edge. There you go. Uh, <laughs> And he's got, you know, unfeathered support from a lot of people. <laughs> Did you hear the unfeathered chicken? Unfeathered. Right, anyway. wah, 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 yeah. wah. So it passed yes. the first hurdle. Yeah, it went through the floor, the Senate floor. Uh, next up, we got to go to through the House of Representatives. Now there's a few more people that are against it. Uh, there was, it, it passed 29 to 1, by the way, in the That's Senate. That's awesome. Yeah, the only guy that voted against it even told us, he said, listen, I like the bill. I personally would like it, but my constituents are in Chandler and I'm getting all kinds of crap from my Chandler constituents. Yeah, I don't know if you use crap, but I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Basically said I need to represent the people that brought me into office and Good I res- for him. I respect that he still got killed in the <laughs> – I mean hey. 29 to 1. Yeah, go ahead. Vote the other way. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if you guys are – I'm going to post a link to the – Homegrown Freedom Act Publication PDF. Um, I also want everybody to go out to Facebook, look at Backyard Farmers United, and you can join that Facebook group. There's fan pages. Um, look on on Facebook for that. I think and the Homegrown, Homegrown Freedom, Freedom, Act Freedom Act is also Act on there. Is, yeah, it is. Uh, Galen, again, thank you for all of your hard work. Um, you're doing a phenomenal job. I'm going to post the PDF in our show notes. So everybody can go take a look at that at wegrowers.com. Yeah, send the support our way. We we need numbers. We need a lot of numbers. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So that's that's the update. So we're we're trying to get this thing pushed through the house at this point. Yep, House of Representatives will get that done. I I feel like it's right now we're running at eighty four percent for it and a small fraction of percent against it. But we need to become as strong at least ninety percent. That means all you folks that have something to do, or excuse me, that have a free minute. There you go. Have you got a free minute? Sorry, brain fart. Get on the website, click on the petition, and let them know that you are for this to pass. Yeah, there's a couple of websites listed on there that they you can go on and you can go out and vote. Um, you can comment on other websites that that are running articles, things like that. And remember, if uh, for some of them you need to be an Arizona voter, an Arizona resident. If you're not in Arizona. Um, we have a lot of listeners in California. We have a lot of listeners across the country. Uh, we want your support, guys, and we want this to be successful so then other states can take this and use it as a template. That's right. And, and continue on with this work. It is the right of every homeowner to raise some chickens on their own property, in our opinion. We hope you guys are with us. Uh, go take a look at the Backyard Farmers United Homegrown Freedom Act on Facebook. I'll post all the links on our show notes at wegrowers.com. Awesome. So we're going to bring Justin Rohner on. That's right. All right. This week on the We Grow Our Shows, we got Justin Rohner with Agriscape. Am I saying that right, Justin? Yeah. You got it all good. Awesome. Well, welcome to We Grow Ours. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. That's good. So Agriscape, first off, cool name. Please explain. How'd you come up with the name? Well, agriscaping, um, kind of, it, it rolls back a long ways back, I guess. I came from an agricultural background and stuff, and so my grandparents were always growing things and doing big ag with big dairy and big chicken and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but landscaping was what my mom always liked doing. You know, everything had to look pretty, look pristine. And, uh, you know, started off when I was nine working at a golf course, and, you know, there was no such thing as agriculture in a golf course scenario. It was all, Everything had to look pretty. Everything had to look perfect. Ooh, child and, labor. Uh, yeah, child labor, yes. <laughs> I, I was part of that movement that probably got rid of it, I'm sure. Yeah, I started at 275 an hour. That's uh, That was minimum wage at the time. And uh, where is it now? I don't know, 10 bucks? They're trying to get 10 bucks? Anyway. 10 10. But agriscaping is uh, an elegant blend of the best of productive agriculture and the best of ornamental landscaping. 
hence ag escaping. Oh. So I'm going to take away from that that you are planting a beautiful landscape out of everything edible. Yep, and and productive because it's not just edibles. I mean, we, we look at ag rescaping. It's not just about edibles. It's about being productive. It's about producing everything that we can on our own property, you know, regardless of size, regardless of location. I live in a very strict HOA. When I started this, I lived in a very strict H- HOA, and it, it really all came around uh, – from 9-11, like the day of 9-11, that morning I was putting on my shoes to to uh, to go to a meeting to sign on my very first house and my very first debt, you wow. know, with the house. And so I'm like, I'm going to go get 120 grand in debt and, uh, and the world's coming to an end. <laughs> I was like, I've got to find a way to grow more food. <laughs> Yeah, and I can I can see that as a, a scary day to go sign some mortgage paper. Yeah, I was like, like what is going on? I mean, everything goes to pot. Well, hey, maybe the bank will go to pot too. So part of me was celebrating, but not so much. <laughs> That's awesome. So if one good thing came out of that day, Justin Rohner was motivated to grow more food. Yeah, and to grow it. And, and the key was, it's like I knew that, that – if things really didn't go to to heck in a handbasket or whatever because of 9-11 and everything followed thereafter, it's like if it wasn't going to happen then, then my HOA was still going to be as crazy and strict as I thought he was going to be. And yeah. so I was determined I'm going to grow food and you may not even know it. You're going to praise me because my yard looks that good and you won't even realize that I'm growing a bunch of edible stuff. So you could flat out say, yeah, the yard looks good and it's delicious. And it's delicious. It tastes as good as it looks. You know, I mean <laughs> – you know, because I wanted them to be on my side. I didn't want to be against them because I knew that the HOA had some had some influence too. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, hey, uh, maybe I could use some of the other citrus trees that I saw growing around there, and maybe they'd give me permission to start picking those. You know, or, or grafting in even on those nasty oh, sour oranges. oranges. Maybe yeah, they'd let me graft in some good stuff. You know, or maybe I'd sneak them in. You know, gorilla grafting. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's next week's class, right? Gorilla grafting class. Speaking no. of classes, Justin, you are going to be a teacher. Absolutely. I kind of already am, but I'm going to be doing something with you guys, I think, here pretty quick. That's right. In April, on the 5th and 6th, we're going to have you – actually, your classes will be on the 5th. Yep. And you're going to be discussing – well, I'll, I'll let you tell. what You're doing two <laughs> classes. Give us give us a rundown. What can we expect well, from those classes? Well, the the first class that we'll be doing will be, I, I think the first class will be homestead planning. And so it takes this agriscaping principle, and what we've been doing for about the last decade and a half or so is helping people design their yards in ways that become not only sustainable but productive. Beyond just survival, I like to help people to thrive and to create a new economy for themselves, that they become literally a leader of their own economy and that they're producing more than they consume to the point that they could literally hire people to run their yard and still make money on it. So that's another distinction of agriscaping is that to create a true homestead and to plan your homestead in a way that looks amazing and produces a profit for you. I mean, I just designed a yard uh, a week ago and we spec'd it out very conservatively to be able to grow $49,000 a year in revenue. Ooh, and what's And this property is about a third acre. Third of an acre, 50K. 50K a year in revenue that could be generated from that. And I told him, well, hey, look, you're going to eat probably 20,000 of that. And so you've got another 20,000 that you could then pay people to literally run your plantation. So all you do is eat from it. So now we're creating micro plantations around the world. So does that include. Animals, or is that just plants and, and landscaping? No, this one also includes some animals integrated into it because I think it's important to have some of your own animals growing some, you know, you know, like even mine. I have a property that's a third acre, and I've got rabbits, I've got fish, I've got chickens. I'm going to have some quail here pretty quick, and they're all integrated into my landscaping system. My, my homestead plan includes all of those so that really recycles everything on site. So I'm able to create my own mulches, my own composts, create all this stuff, and use my own gray water. So I'm not using a lot of excess water. I'm able to rainwater harvest. I'm, I'm able to use water I'm already using and uh, and really create a more sustainable environment just in even a third acre. I mean, my, my yard is designed out, looks amazing. I have a lot of grass still, and mine does about 36000 a year. Wow. 
Well, that that's true. I I actually had the pleasure of going over to Justin's house, and it looks amazing. And uh, it was pretty cool standing in the front yard. And I I can't remember if this were the exact words, but he looks right at me. He says, uh, "You're standing on my salad." <laughs> <laughs> Like so, being in awe and watch where you're stepping, right? Exactly. <laughs> so here's here's another question. Now, a, a few of us know what uh, permaculture is, and uh, how would you describe what you're doing? Let's we'll do like a, a small Venn diagram, if you will, of <laughs> of uh, permaculture versus agriscaping. So I would say permaculture permaculture is a great foundation for anybody who wants to do agriscaping. And we're working on a certification course. We've been doing it with the, with actually the state and a few other organizations with certifications for agriscapers. And we're already training some agriscapers right now. But one of the things that we allow them to do is that we want them, we actually want them to go to a permaculture course so they can learn some of the fundamentals of how to grow food and how to be sustainable. And then they come to an agriscaping class and we teach them how to make it look amazing and still be absolutely productive. And, and then integrate it into the local food economy. So I think beyond permaculture, permaculture for me is about survival. It's about growing food, creating these food forests, and I love it. I mean, the principles are right on. And then we now integrate it and we be, get, become a little more intentional with design to the point of making it look amazing, very easy to manage, and municipalities love us. They love us, so I'm not going to have to waste any time fighting with my municipality on whether I'm able to grow food in my front yard. They're actually calling me up saying, hey, can you teach another class? I mean, that's nice. the calls I get. I don't get the calls from the city saying, hey, you got, you got to get rid of rows of corn. They don't know I'm growing corn. <laughs> but, you know, if they came out there, I could point it out, you know. They don't know I'm growing squash and watermelon and, and all these beautiful edible plants. And They don't know I've got goji berries growing in my front yard. They're just like, awesome plant, man. That's a great layout. I love what you've done with your yard. They don't know my lawn is edible. They don't know. That's pretty cool. Now, you mentioned you're, you're running some certification courses. So uh, let's say I've got AAA landscaping as my business and uh -huh. mowing grass is what I know. And I've already got all of the tools and everything to mow grass and all of this. Can I go and get certified and then be an agriscaping certified uh gardener, I guess an agriscaper, and then market it that way. Absolutely. So you would be able to keep your own business name and say, hey, we're a certified agriscaping. We do agriscaping as an additional service that we offer to our clients. You know, so they could go to literally the clients they've known for years and been working with for years and say, hey, how much how, would you like to make your property make you money rather than just cost you money? He's like, we've got a new technology that we'd love to bring into, into play into your yard that we can convert it from consumptive to productive through agriscaping. And so that's exactly what we're doing. And we're actually sending business to our agriscapers. There's more business for agriscaping than we can handle with our current crews. That's why we're expanding the way we are. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, it's, it's literally, we, we were kind of joking about it the other day in, in a business meeting. It's like, this is like the hundred year leap in agriculture that everyone's been waiting for, where we can integrate currently used resources in the, awesome farmland that's now been overtaken by houses and and development and all that stuff and reconverted to farmland again. Yeah. But with, do it in a more organized way that decreases the amount of waste and decreases the amount of travel that food has to go. I mean, the average, it's 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles is the average distance that food travels for Arizona market. Now, that's that's really interesting too, because the Arizona market is desert. You know, we have had traditional agriculture out here with um, irrigation and, and flood irrigation for the most part. Now you're bringing that back into what used to be all these big lots and these big areas that had tract houses put on them and we're converting that land back into farming land. But rather than flood irrigation, it sounds like you were mentioning using your gray water. You're actually converting these houses and you're using the water consumption that the person's using in their daily lives to help feed these gardens and do this. How does that all work? Yeah, I mean, well, it kind of goes down to the first thing that we do as agriscapers for a client. We do a, a productivity analysis and design consult for the property. So we literally come out and we do an assessment of the property to figure out how much it could produce and to also look at the gray water sources and see which of them are easiest to tap into. Every house has between four and eight 
you know, accessible points for gray water usage. And those each have a certain amount of water that we can estimate that's being used or just being wasted going down the drain that we could divert into growing your veg and growing your edibles. Like, for instance, on my house, we tapped into a tub, a shower, and two sinks for one, for one, uh, um, one gray water system. And that's enough water to, to grow 10,000 plant units or about 2,500 square feet. And each square foot to us is worth about $10 a year in revenue. And so everybody that's got their, their houses, you're looking at your acreage. Well, we like, we, we farm in square feet. And so we calc it out from that. And we usually figure about 30% of a property can be converted to agriscaping, you know, to be a fully agriscaped square foot. All right, hey, hang on, Justin, hang on for a second. I want to go back because I think this is probably one of the most important things that somebody's going to pull out of this podcast. I want you to repeat what you just said. Uh, what was it per square foot one more time? So conservatively, and literally, I'm only going to share it because it's proven and we've proven it twice as much as this, is $10 a square foot per year. Whoa, that's, that's phenomenal. That's how much revenue you can create. And, and, and I'm speechless with that. It's phenomenal. <laughs> It's amazing. I think our keyword here is awesome. Awesome. And <laughs> everything I, I, is awesome. I, I had to pause you at that because again, I think it's, it's something that's missing right now is that people don't understand that they can profit from doing this. A lot of our core audience is the prepper movement mm-hmm. and, and permaculture. And like you said, it's kind of survival, but there's a, there's a whole nother step beyond that with agriscaping and integration where you can not only survive in bad times, but you can thrive in good times and you can actually make money doing this. Yes, absolutely. And and something I love to share with people, it's like, look, if you control the food, you control, you are the new governor of your town or whatever. It's like, you are the new governor, man. I mean, you're the mayor, you're the, you're the person that everyone comes to because you're producing something. Yeah. And, and that's a vital component to really consider from the prepper side of stuff. It's like, look, it's not just about survival and who, how many people I can shoot so I can protect my plot. It's like, hey, how can I serve them? You know, how many people can I serve? And that's one of the stats we give people is how many people you could literally feed, how many mouths you could feed from your property in an elegant way. And that's another distinction, too, because things that look good, people like to work on. Right. If it looks terrible, they hate being in it, which means it's going to go to even more problems. And then it just becomes a weed magnet. <laughs> and you can teach your neighbors to do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And then some you can focus on uh, certain things and your neighbor focuses on some other things. I mean, when I look at a game plan, I usually take into consideration what's already grown in your neighbor's yard that they're probably not going to use. It's like, hey, I see you have on your list here, you want pecans. Your neighbor has like 14 pecan trees, <laughs> and I guarantee you can't eat all those. Are you sure you want to grow pecans or should we do almonds, you know? Like let's let's do something else. Let's be cooperative with our our neighborhood and and grow things in a way that creates a community that doesn't step on everybody's toes. Because I mean it's it's easy to do. No, I like the, your way of thinking there. The the synergy of it's it's one reason why you got to be nice to your neighbors because eventually you're going to need more than maybe a cup of sugar. Uh, like, can I borrow some of them pecans you're growing? Yeah, you got some pecans. I got sugar beets. <laughs> <laughs> so I got sugar beets. So here's a question for you. You've got all of this fantastic food growing on your lot. Do you have a devoted area that you raise food just for the animals that you're raising? I mean, I heard you have chickens, rabbits, and fish. Do you have plants there that are designated to those animals? Well, what I have on a third acre, and usually when we get down to a half acre or smaller, then we start looking at fodder growing systems that would be more internal, like uh, basically some fodder growing that you can do in layers. Um, and stack them so you can easily grow sprouts and you can grow wheat grass, you can grow barley grass, you can do that in flats. Okay. And you can literally layer them inside your garage or something like that. But for the most part, on these smaller properties, we literally integrate the fodder within of what we're growing. So, for instance, when you're, if I'm growing a bunch of broccoli, I know that that broccoli is really good for a few of my animals. And when we prep and clean the broccoli, we're usually not eating the broccoli stalks and we're not eating the broccoli greens. We're just mm-hmm. eating the broccoli florets. And so all that becomes now fodder for my chickens. 
Yeah, my and great goat, stuff my for the chickens. Goats love broccoli, by the way. Oh, you, you I hit believe that it. on the head because those goats go insane for broccoli. Exactly, and some of the like mammoth greens, like mammoth beet greens, uh, the the sugar beet, the sugar beet greens aren't as powerful for us, but that's amazing goat feed. That's like awesome goat feed. Hmm. So we just integrate it into the landscape for the most part, but then we'll have a couple sections. It's like like I said, indoors we'll kind of do more of a hydroponic or an aquaponic system to then grow fodder like crazy just in 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 a fodder growing system but then bigger yards like uh you know we got a three and a half acre one that we designed a few months ago that's being installed right now you know we sectioned off their areas of their their we basically set up their paddocks for their goats so that they literally can just keep rotating it from one section to the next and have it keep regrowing and alternating the the paddock that they send them into and effectively be able to feed all of their animals just by how we manage and how we set up their design for all their their paddocks, you know, so they can just send them into one area and close off another part, let that grow, and they'll work that and grow it all up, and then they just rotate them across. So these grazers are getting their good alternating diet right there in play. There's not a lot of work involved in that. It's just seed and, and water, you know. That's actually – that's pretty cool. I went over to a guy's house this morning that has a rabbit tractor. Yeah. He basically, he doesn't mow his yard. He just moves the tractor four feet a day and the rabbits just munch it down to the perfect height and then on to the next little deal. But in Wisconsin where my, my dad has a beef farm, uh, he does that same thing. It's pasture rotation. He doesn't have mm-hmm. all the animals on all the pastures at the same time. He allows the pasture to rest and then kicks them out to another pasture while that one is resting and it comes back. Uh, and then he, he just he just opens the gate up and they go where the grass is greener. Um, yep, exactly. So that's that's what's awesome is that means you don't have any machinery harvesting. Nope. You don't have any added fuel costs in in dragging stuff around. The animal is actually out there making food for you and mowing the yard. That's awesome. Exactly. Now speaking. If, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say if you let them even go to seed, you can even take them to the seed level on some of the some of the you know, the fodder growing that you get it, go to seed, then you got your own seed that you harvest first. So you walk into that paddock and you harvest the seed and then let the, let the goats in or let the animals into that section. And you got your seed for the next rotation. It's pretty slick. Now you mentioned that you've got chickens there and you also mentioned that you're in a strict HOA. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me tell you real quick. When my wife and I bought a house in an HOA, the first thing we thought was, Oh, let's get some chickens. It'll be great. We didn't look at the CCNRs. We didn't ask our neighbors. We just bought 10 chickens and turned them loose in the backyard, uh, not knowing that their wings were not clipped. So uh, three months into our new house, we got to meet all the neighbors while we collected our chickens. And uh, needless to say, there were some phone calls made and and uh, things didn't turn out so well for the Kleins and, and their chicken endeavor. So <laughs> please – Give us a few hints as how to raise chickens in an HOA without making your neighbors upset. Well, and I'll preface it with this. So I've never had a call, a negative call on my chickens. I've had as many as 25 roosters and 170 chickens on my property all at one time. This is on your third of an acre? This is on my third of an acre and I've never gotten a call. That's a lot of chickens. Oh my God. That's a lot of chickens. And, and... Truth be known, we were raising most of them just from chicks up into the, about two months, and then we were selling them. And one of the things when I first started doing chickens in our in our backyard in this HOA environment is uh, I came out one morning, and I heard this rah, this crazy squawk. And I'm like, what the heck was that? And I, I go over, I find my neighbor, you know, two doors down. So it was that far away. I could still hear this. He's got this massive macaw on his shoulder. Oh. I go, that is sweet. I was like, hey, does that thing lay eggs? And he's like, yeah, like once every three years. No, anyway, it's just like not like a chicken. I was like, well, I guess I can't really raise that. But then I started thinking. I'm like, wait a minute. It's like if he's allowed to have macaws, people allowed to have cockatoos, all that kind of stuff. He's like, oh, I think I'm looking for the wrong kind of bird. So I started looking up a different term, which is where the originating term of where chickens came from. They were all ornamental. They were all jungle fowl. And so we called them ornamental jungle fowl. And so we started aligning our chickens in a way that we're coming from the angle of we're you we're, we're these are tropical birds these are pets and so i started focusing on breeds that matched the message of what the hoa would allow 
And so I started off with chickens that were more like the Sultans or the Mellifleur du Clays, these Frenchies with feathered feet, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm focusing on chickens that still lay an egg a day. You know, they'll, they'll lay an egg a day for five days and pause for a day. So we still got a pretty good productive chicken. It's a little bit smaller egg, but nothing smaller than your normal medium egg. But what I've got is a smaller bird, smaller poop, smaller noise. And what I learned from one of our early clients that lives in Ahwatukee is a psychologist and he actually did a study and proved that you could teach chickens how to play ping pong. Oh, dear. Now, when I learned that, I was like, no, really? You, you taught him to play ping pong? And he told me how he did it. And I was like, wait a minute. Well, if you can teach him to play ping pong, we could probably teach him to be quiet. <laughs> we can probably teach him to lay eggs in the right spot. We could probably teach him not to eat their eggs. We could probably, I just started thinking of all the things we could teach him not to do that everyone hates about chicken. Oh, so man. we started designing chicken paddocks with that in mind, chicken psychology. And so we, it changed the way we did the chicken coop thing. It changed the way we did our feeding schedules. It changed the way we trained them. And now all of a sudden we have trained chickens. And so if they get noisy, I'll know why. And a lot of times I can even tell by the sound of the chickens, the chickens that, that the chickens are making, what the problem is, whether it's a cat or I just flat out missed giving them water. You know, that the water thing is run dry. And so there's all these little tricks, which I think goes into why you probably brought me in to teach the whole chicken exactly. thing I w- at this upcoming conference. Part of the reason, you know, when I was at your house, I couldn't hear them. I couldn't smell them. I didn't know they were there until you said, oh, and over here is our compost pile, a.k.a. the chicken pen. And I'm like, wait, what? I look in there and sure enough, there's a bunch of chickens and they're just quiet looking at me. I couldn't believe it. So that's that's definitely why you're on the roster and uh, hopefully – Hopefully we didn't give away all of the teaching methods. So where the can goodies. people sign up for it? Where can people yeah. sign up for the class? <laughs> um, actually, do you have the do you have the button up on your site yet? Or do they? I don't know. But what what's the website? Is it just a button so they can go to iagrescape dot com and I'll put a button on there? Is there a website that you guys have that has the button on it? Yeah, we have homesteadconference.com. dot mm-hmm. com. You can link to it from the wegrowars.com dot com website and. Uh, find out all the information. It's under events. Uh, again, homesteadconference.com. We'll have to work with you on getting you the button for your site as well. Yes. Yeah, so I, I thought yeah, that Tiffany had already sent that over to you, the marketer on this one. And, and while well, we're on that, Justin, you have, um, I'm sure you've got a lot of people out there saying, wow, this guy's amazing. What is he talking about? How do I get a hold of him? So how do we get a hold of you? How do we get your information out there? And, you know, what areas do you service? I know you also are looking for other landscapers. So if there's landscapers out there listening, even if they're not in Arizona, you know, do you work with that? How do they get a hold of you? Well, let me give you three things. So three ways you can get a hold of me. So iagrescape.com. You can go to iagrescape.com. And that's I-A-G-R-I-S-C-A-P-E.com, iagrescape.com. And that's where you can find out more information. There's some uh, free edible flower guide that we have on there because that's one of the things we love to integrate in. Um, a second way, what go, yeah, edible flowers, it's fun. I mean, at the farmer's markets, we actually have been selling out of our edible flowers about every week. Oh, wow. Uh, it's, it's really fun. It's a fun thing to throw in a salad. I mean, you'll get, you'll get people taking pictures of salads, you know, <laughs> even those that only love meat. They're just like, dude, you got flowers in your salad. <laughs> Is that okay? Are you all right eating that? See, I, I'm one that usually says, uh, you know, the waitress come out, would you like a soup or a salad? I'm like, uh, salad is what food eats. <laughs> but I think I'd try it if it had flowers in it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you try a good nasturtium, man. I mean, if you think you're a man, let's see you eat a nasturtium. Let's see if you can handle a spice of a nasturtium. I can't even you know? pronounce a nasturtium. <laughs> <laughs> <man. laughs> but that's, so I com, and on that, I, I would highly re- recommend anybody that's going to get into agriscaping and really want to be productive on their own their own property. We've got a tour coming up on March 29th, so it'll be basically the week before the class. I would highly recommend coming to the tour. It's actually of my yard. We're going to have a, a TV chef. He'll be there at my property and stuff, but you'll need to sign up early because we always sell out of our tickets for the tour. And it's right there on the left-hand side. It says Edible Garden Tour. And you can click on that. You can actually sign up right there to be able to come to the tour and really see what we've been doing in this little space, you know, with a big attitude. I'm registering now. (laughs) (laughs) 
And that's a perfect combo. I mean, if you come see it in real life and then come to my class, come to the classes that we're doing the week later, it's a perfect fit because you have a real good context of how to integrate what you want to do in your yard, you know, at the class. It's perfect because if you're just coming to the class, I'm going to show a lot of pictures. I'm going to show a lot of really cool stuff. But being there and seeing it and feeling it and touching it and all that kind of stuff, being able to see it all actively happening, a profitable yard, and to see how good it can look, that's a totally different experience. Yeah, and I I will say firsthand that was – I won't quite say breathtaking, but I was in awe the whole time. It was breathtaking. I'll go ahead and give it to you. It was good. (laughs) Well, did I even take you down into the, the subterranean garden under the trampoline? You did. Yeah, I got to go in there and it was – I I can't remember what time of year it was, but it was hot outside and it was like 82 degrees underneath the trampoline. So yeah. That that's, was cool. And that's another beautiful component of – I mean, homestead planning, you know, in smaller spaces, it's important to know what your microclimates are, which is something that we teach. We can grow things here in Arizona that no other farmer would dare grow here in Arizona because you have microclimates hidden in pockets around your entire yard. You know, full sun is not the only place you can grow. Absolutely not. It's probably the worst place to grow. It's not the worst. It's what we would call a B-level zone. We've got A through F zones, and in every zone, you can grow stuff in. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to this class. This is going to be awesome. You're, you're, i got to tell you, I haven't looked at your website here uh, until now, and it is phenomenal. Um, you've got a lot of information here for people to go take a look at. Absolutely. And our Facebook page, that's another thing. You can go to Agriscaping. So Facebook forward slash Agriscaping, and you'll you'll see part of the community that's growing. I mean, just from last year, we went from nobody to 18,000 people, and we haven't advertised it at all. This is probably the first time it's even been on an airwave anywhere that we even have a Facebook page. We don't even promote it on our website. Nice. So it's it's an interesting thing that's happening. And the Facebook page, it's talking about where people are doing things like Agriscaping around the country, around the world. We've got 36 different countries being served through that Facebook page. And we've got, you know, a lot of recipes, all straight from your garden kind of recipes. We're collaborating with people a lot through that. Good place to go. Justin, I I love the fact you are actually integrating aquaponics into this as well. So that's that's one of my passions, as you know. And, I mean, that fits right in with all this. So I, it's just – it's it's really cool. I, yeah, I, I and you haven't even you haven't even seen store. my aquaponics yet. You haven't seen you haven't seen the one in my kitchen. No, no. You know that it looks good enough to be in my kitchen. Yeah, we you know we we've got some really I don't know do, Nick, you saw the pictures of the new aquaponics systems coming yes. out. Yes, we're doing. I got to show you those because you're going to absolutely love those. We've got some new ones coming out designed for the patio and the kitchen. I want to see Ooh, yours, yeah. and I want to show you the other ones. And then I know you're doing it in your garage because we just got you a system for that. Right, but you're doing it outside too. Well, and that's that's another interesting component. We've integrated them into uh, people's ponds in their backyards. We've integrated aquaponics into their full their full landscape system, their whole agriscape. Right. I mean, where we've got tilapia growing in a pond, and then at the base of that pond, we have a sump pump. So all that chick, all that uh, fish poop is basically pumping in through their new valved watering system. So their automatic watering system is literally pumping out from their pond. And then their pond is refilled using gray water sources. That was a that's a question that I wanted to ask earlier when you were talking about the gray water. Uh, there's some pretty nasty stuff that's available on the market to clean you know, your conventional cleaners. What kind of changes do you have to make in order to not kill your plants and and poison yourself with the stuff that you're cleaning your sinks and your and your toilet? Well, not your toilets. That's not great. That's that's black water, but uh, and even even the shampoos that you're using. I mean, what? Well, and that's there's a lot of just common sense. The common sense involved. I mean, any any aquaponic system or any uh, gray water system, excuse me, any gray water system needs to have a three way valve or some type of way to valve it so that you can have it just go back to the sewer or go out to your go out to your growing beds. Okay. And so that's one of the key components. And that is the biggest change is the cleaners. It's not so much the shampoos and the soaps that you use. A lot of the things that are bad for your plants and bad for food um, have been outlawed. But the common sense side of it is like, hey, don't be washing your kid's hair and, and, and you know, using your gray water system and washing your kid's hair or whatever with a soap that's neon green or any neon color and that bubbles last for about 10 minutes. You know, you, none of that stuff is going to be useful to you. There's Oasis soaps that are out there that are very, they're 
vegetable glycerin based, very good for your skin, very good for you as a person and very good for the environment and great for gray water systems. Actually beneficial. And you're only hooking up, I, I want to go back to that too, you're only hooking up a few sinks or maybe a, a tub, uh, things like that, so you can be right. conscious of what sinks you're using or what bathroom you're using if you have to use any harsh chemicals. So Correct. It's and not it, too bad of a change, I would think. No, it's really not much of a change. I mean, the other things you look for is you don't want any cobalt-based salts or any metal-based salts and so that's something to look on on the back of your ingredient bottles is looking for metal-based salts. Those are the things that you don't want going down the drain and going out and thinking because you've already got enough salts in your soil if you live in Arizona. You don't need to add any more metallic salts, and those are the things that are going to be bad for you. The borons, um, the chloramines, you know, some of these other things, that's the bad stuff. Um, and then certainly on the side of uh, the, the easiest source for gray water, like the most effective, the most cost-effective source for gray water is if you have an RO system, a reverse osmosis system, oh, yeah. for every gallon of water that produces for you to drink, nice clean water, it throws 10 gallons down the drain. That's for every gallon, 10 gallons down noise. the drain. Oh. Yeah. 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 And that I is pressurized know. water. It's pressurized water, and it's already on a quarter-inch line, which means you can add a quarter-inch drip line right to that. And if you're like my family, we can water... 560 square feet of growing beds off of our RO system just because of the water we normally drink in the day from that RO system. That's amazing. That's amazing that we're in a desert, everybody's drinking RO water, and we're complaining about the drought, and there goes <laughs> 10 gallons of good water down the drain just because we need clear water. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if everybody's wow. drinking even just a half gallon a day, you know, that's you know, that's still an extra you still got an extra five gallons of water that's just going down the drain. Automatically pressurized, could already, could automatically be going to these beds. It's like, it's crazy, and it's so easy to tap into. I mean, if you got a quarter-inch drill or a, you know, or a half-inch drill, and you just drill it through your wall and then feed that line outside your house rather than just have it go into their sewer in your, you know, in your, under your sink, because everyone has that. It's a little pick line that goes right into your sewer. Right. Just remove it out of that, plug that up, and put it outside, and then attach some quarter-inch drip lines to it. Put it right in your beds. Love that. You'll be amazed what you'll grow. So uh, we, we're going to wrap up this pretty quick. But with all of this said, and I know the ten dollars a square foot, I'm still sitting on that. Hmm. But what would su- what would a typical one third acre? Uh, what would the budget be? And and can we do this over time? Is this something that you can do slowly and kind of build up to, or is this something you kind of need to do all at once? What are you looking at for a budget to get this started and and transform your yard? into this this phenomenal system that you're doing? Well, when we look at a budget for it, I like to look at it as, okay, I, I should be putting in $10 per square foot and just kind of look at that as a kind of a budget. But I can phase that in over time, absolutely. I mean, we've got clients, we, we do a Fab Five. We actually, we need one more Fab Five family. We've got one more spot available for the entire year that we work with for the entire year to convert their property from consumptive to productive and profitable. And uh, what we do with those families, literally, it's like we might design a yard. So we put a lot of emphasis in the in the time into the design and typical designs to get it fully done and designed out with your schedules for planting and each square foot per year. Make it really simple for yourself, zoning it out. It costs between seven hundred and fifty and twenty five hundred dollars to get the full design done. Okay. But once the design is done, let's say when we did a guy's yard. We designed it, and it was probably designed. If it was all done at once, it would have been about thirty-five grand to do his whole yard. But with the way we phased it in, and the way we integrated it in, and basically, it, he was out of pocket six grand total, because including our, our our consulting fees to help him integrate it in and phase it in. So he's he's taking that that ten dollars a square foot back, and then putting it into the next project. Well, and that's that's even taken to the next step. No, what I'm saying is that even. So coming from a landscaper's perspective, if it's all done at one time, one big massive project, that means we're buying all the materials, we're doing all the stuff. But see, we're buying all the plant materials, we're doing all the things. But when people buy with seed and grow their own stuff, they get educated. You know, they're going to these classes like we're teaching in April. You know, they're learning how to do these things for themselves, and they start integrating it in. It decreases the cost dramatically to install such a system. Gotcha. And same with you get more creative in your sourcing. I mean, there's 
you know, one man's junk is another man's treasure, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I got you know, a wheelbarrow the, the other day sitting on the side <laughs> exactly. of the road. Exactly. So. Well, Justin, I appreciate your time. Um, I know we're going to have to have you back on the show. Uh, this has been fascinating. You've given us a ton of information to process. I will make sure that all of your links are in our show notes. And I, I want to personally thank you for, for just educating us. This is really what we're about. This is what We Grow Ours is about. And, you know, you fit right into this. So thank you for coming on and, and, and teaching us and our listeners. Well, Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, thanks again, Justin. Appreciate you on coming on to the show today. Look forward to hearing you at the class. Yeah. April. April 5th and 6th. 5th and 6th. Homesteadconference.com. That's right. Justin will be teaching the first day. So again, thanks, Justin. All right. So this week, we are going to recognize another local business started up by an entrepreneur, <laughs> a fellow fat man. Uh, Brady Bogan. He is co-host on the morning show, The Morning Sickness with John Holmberg. That's on 98. Really? KUP. That's how you, okay. Yeah. This guy, it, it's funny because I, a few months ago, I called in, they do this thing called the fireside chats where, uh, they make the claim that they, they say, well, you guys are pissed off that we never answer the phone. Well, Friday morning is your day. You can call in, you can talk about whatever you want. We just ask that you don't waste our time. So I called in and posed as the know nothing redneck and said, I'm just sick of GMOs and all the crap they're feeding us at the stores. And the guy says, okay, yeah. And well, I think we need to eat more rabbits. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> and he put me on with them. And for 12 minutes and 30 seconds flat, they tore me apart <laughs> for eating rabbits, for eating rabbits and for being, uh, overly. Uh, into the non-GMO stuff and, and it was actually awesome. I, I really appreciated them. I say any publicity is good publicity, but they were, Brady Bogan was actually really nice about what he was saying because I think he had eaten rabbit. And anyway, bottom line, he started up, uh, a barbecue sauce a few years ago and it took off and then everybody said, Hey, you ought to open up a barbecue place. And he did. It's in Chandler. It's called Porkopolis. And Don, do you have the website over I there? I do. I have the website. It's a, it's a nice menu of barbecue. Oh, I've been there and it's delish. I have to go there. It's porkopolisbbqaz.com. Porkopolis, just like, I can't spell and I spelled it. So yeah, bbqaz.com. Yeah. And I think uh, I typed it into Google Maps. And before I finished spelling it, it actually popped up. So yeah. it's popular enough. Yeah, it's it's pretty popular. You can find it. It looks like they, they're on Twitter. They're on Facebook. Um, so that's going to be the random plug of the week? Yeah, that's our random plug of the week is uh, Brady Bogan's Porkopolis in Chandler. If you're in the area, stop in there. I had, I believe it was brisket and some pulled pork. And it blows every other barbecue shop in town out of the water. I'm a barbecue fanatic, so I yeah. really need to go in there and try this place. It's, it's a little far for me, but if it's that good, it's going to be worth the worth the drive. Yeah. So it looks like it's in the Santan Gateway Center next to the Sam's Club. Yep. In Arizona it's, Ave. It's pretty much right on Arizona Ave in the 202, just south of the 202, a little ways. So Porkopolis is our random plug of the week. Porkopolis. All right. So what else we got in store? We had Justin Roner on. We talked about SB 1151. Uh, Senator Farnsworth, he's doing some other good things. He's That's got right. another bill that he's sponsored in Arizona. All right. All you Arizonians, I forget what is, what, where you can vote for Senator Farnsworth, what area you have to be in, but I will tell you this. He is coming up for reelection and the guy that's running against him totally bad mouth the homegrown freedom act. He's like, Oh, we need to be worried about jobs and education and. I agree. Jobs and education are very important. But the way that he went about it, it sounded very um, juvenile and very broad in general. He didn't really have a plan of attack. He just started attacking uh, Senator Farnsworth. He he said the chickens uh, and uh, there was a sewer bill that was pushed through by, by Senator Farnsworth. Both of them great, great reasons to – to, to take a bill to the Senate. Well, just recently, there is another bill that uh, Senator Farnsworth is bringing up, 
and that is what is it called? You know, I'm I'm not going to answer that. It's an NSA related bill. Yes. Um, I'm I'm still looking here on the internet for it. I'll I'll get the links out to it. Farnsworth, though, I'm, I'm just looking at some of his his information. He's he's online. It looks like he's Republican District 16 for anybody out here that's voters. District 16, Arizona. Yeah. An interesting guy. I mean, you know, he's he's a good dude. I've I've been to a few meetings where he was uh, he I guess you could say he's presiding. I don't know. He he was in not in charge of it, but he was there present, getting the getting the info from the people and seeing what we wanted and uh that's where Senate Bill 1151 came up and uh we now we got it through the Senate uh we got to go through the House of Representatives next but uh he also has one on the docket that basically reins in the powers of the NSA it's a direct protection on the state level of corrupt and illegal wiretapping and monitoring of innocent civilians. So it's basically putting the microscope back on Big Brother. So it's part of the Arizona NDAA. All my libertarian friends out there, you're very familiar with the NDAA. I don't even know what that means. Uh, National Defense Authorization Act. There's some bad things about it, but it looks like uh, Judy Burgess introduced SB 1291 that would ban the state of Arizona from enforcing I'm going to go through all this, but um, sections of the National Defense Authorization Act. So it's kind of an anti-NDAA, uh, NDAA nullification bill. So I'll, again, I'll put some some more information on that. It was drafted by the Arizona Tenth Amendment Center uh, against the National Defense Authorization Act. So I, I know my libertarian friends out there are probably familiar with this, but it's worth looking into in Arizona, in, in my opinion, and, and learning a little bit more on this. So. Yeah, I'd we'll kind of keep an eye on this one. Definitely. Well, this will be a hot topic for, for weeks to come. Basically, I, I heard the argument the other day and it really just, it just ruffled my feathers. Somebody said, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, what do you have to worry about? Ugh. And a fourth amendment violation would be a good start to worry about. Yeah. The fact that our constitution is being sent through the shredder. That is one thing that I don't like. Uh, they can just do whatever they want and nobody should have that kind of power. Well, and um, we're going to get into politics. We got to look at the fact that just the other day we had some Republicans and uh, most of them voted nay, but the ones that didn't happen to be up for reelection decided to uh, basically hand over all of our spending powers to the executive branch and say, here you go, you know, Mr. President, uh, Mr. POTUS, go ahead, do whatever you want for the next, uh, what, 18 months. Uh, all spending is entirely your discretion now. Um, so I'm not real happy about that. Uh, there's a lot of political things coming up. Let's see how much money he can spend. What the heck? Just, just give him a checkbook, bunch of blank checks. Just spend away. I, I you know, I've heard bankrupt this thing. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I'm just going to start voting for everything, uh, because that way we can get this over with faster. Yeah, I don't I, know if I believe it, but guys, I know prepping, um, start getting prepared for something, uh, whether it's just, agriscaping and turning your yard into, yes. into food, whether it's feeding your neighbor, teaching them how to do aquaponics, reach out to us. You can always ask questions, but you can reach out to Nick. He is an expert in rabbits. That's right. Uh, I, I happen to know a few things about aquaponics. Off the show, reach out to us. Let us know if you guys have questions, if you need advice. You know, We're happy to help everybody out. We want to educate our community, not just here in Arizona. Um, I have a personal goal. A goal of mine is called uh, reach and teach. I want to reach as many people as I can and teach them everything that I can, which is why we try to have people like Justin on. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the next few weeks and politics aside, uh, we're excited about the podcast. Oh, yeah. We're making some headway here. We're going to be getting on with uh, – what was the name of the – Oh, a APN Radio, APN. which is uh, PrepperBroadcasting.com. Remember, go check them out. There's a lot of really good – um, talent on there. Education is the key, guys. Mm -hmm. And you've got to put politics aside and talk to people about educating themselves, not just on the political stuff, but on, on food. We can all, we've talked about this on previous shows. We all, can all come together with this whole GMO thing. That's right. You know, and, and I know there are some good that comes out of GMO. Oh yeah. There really is. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what it is and I don't want it in my food. 
I'm tired of things being late. I had a really good video online the other day about natural. Have you mm-hmm. seen that? Did you see that? I didn't. Oh, they, you know, showing, oh, anybody can stamp it natural. It's natural, you know. Uh, yeah, don't it, fall it, for this crap. It naturally lights on fire when you throw it in water. Yeah, don't, don't, don't fall for this. It's ridiculous. Snake venom is natural. <laughs> So uh check out APN Radio. There's a lot of other people on there. We're going to have some really good guests on. Uh We talked on the beginning of the show. Mm. In March, um, we're going to have Sylvia Bernstein. If you guys know aquaponics, you probably know that name. I've worked with Sylvia quite a bit. We're a reseller of her systems here in Arizona. She's coming out with some amazing new systems for inside and outside a patio, kind of small little systems. And she's going to come on and talk about some of the classes that she's doing in Colorado. Colorado now has legalized marijuana for recreational use. Now, Nick and I have a little different feelings about marijuana, which you've probably seen at the end of our show. And if you haven't, go back and listen. Um, however, they're actually doing a class on this up there now in Colorado. That's cool. Now, just to let you know, I feel about marijuana the same way I feel about alcohol. I don't drink alcohol. But I don't care that other, other people do it. Just please don't run into me while you're high when you drive it. Please don't run into me while you're drunk. That's that, you know, don't hurt people with your choices that you make. That's my main point. I've, you know, I've got some religious views on it, but I don't force my religious views on other people. I think that, uh, there's ways to distill marijuana to get some of the, the qualities out of it without smoking it. And, Honestly, I've, I've looked at, uh, if I ever get into a bad situation and need to take Vicodin or any type of hydrocodone or, or things like that, I would look for a natural, a natural placement because the last time I came off of Vicodin, it felt like there was ants crawling underneath my skin. I didn't sleep That's for not three good. days. Yuck. And I still hurt from it. So there's gotta be something better than what these big companies are telling us is the only way to go. That's, I'd rather go to a naturally occurring plant than uh, a group of chemicals that works a certain way in my body. Amen. So, yeah, that's now, that's my thought on it. I'm not going to be out there with my buddies smoking a doobie. Your buddies but, smoke doobies. I'd like to think <laughs> on that. <laughs> so there, there are some other things, and again, we're getting off topic. But med- yeah. medical wear- marijuana, uh, you take out that medical portion and you take out the marijuana portion, you can actually cultivate this crop with no THC and you can make amazing things like oil out of it, plastics out of it, paper out of it, Mm -hmm. um, hemp clothes. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there are, you know, millions of uses. This could be a big agricultural boon for the U S again. In fact, I believe there's a conspiracy theory out there that the paper companies are behind the non legalization of, Marijuana because they've already got a system in place to use tree pulp instead of marijuana. And they could convert. Well, yeah, I know, but it's just like Tyson chickens, why they went after, went after rabbits. They didn't want to have two products that they had to compete against themselves with. Right. right. So I, I agree that there's a lot of uses that, that, uh, in fact, funny story. Uh, <laughs> in, in Wisconsin, marijuana grows wild and they call it ditch weed because there's really no, there's really nothing to get high on in it, but it's still marijuana. And we had, we had a ton of just crap growing out in this field. I didn't know what it was. My sister and I, we were out there picking it and hanging it on the fence. And, and, uh, this is, this was a good 10, 15 years ago. We had no idea what we were doing and, and oh man. We got into so much trouble and that's when I figured out – that's when I was told what marijuana was. It kind of stuck to me after that. that, Nice. That uh, you don't pick marijuana and hang it from the structures of the buildings and the fences because dad's going to whoop you. (laughs) So – but I remember it being a very strong plant. Right. Um, And I imagine dry, it could support a lot of weight. So hemp rope. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of things. And and in Colorado – to get back on point, I think. Uh-huh. Um, they're actually teaching classes. Uh, Sylvia is part of the aquaponics source. Phenomenal. Great book. Uh, if you ever get a chance, you got to pick up her book. Let me know. We sell it on our website. There you um, go. I'll order it for you. So we're going to have her on talking a little bit about what she's doing out there, talking about the classes, not just that one, but all the classes that she offers. Um, also, I want to give a shout out. I think, what is it, next Sunday? Um talking about APN and prepper broadcasting 
9 p.m. Eastern, we are going to be doing a little uh, talk with the other side of Prepper's Path. And I think Nick and I are both going to go on and be guests on this show. Uh, so, you know, go ahead and, and head over there on Sunday. Take a look. It's called The Other Side of Prepper's Path. There it should be go. fun. I'm, I'm excited for it. I, I love doing those types of interviews and talking to new people. And, you know, we've, as preppers and as homesteaders, we've got this, this general feel for, for what we are. But it's nice talking to other people. You mix just a little bit more of their ideas in and it helps, it helps you advance your own goals. Right. And I'm a little nervous. I don't, I, I've done a couple of, you know, live, radio interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, I got the chance to get on KTAR um, out here on do a small business Saturday thing, but we get to edit. Yeah. You know, the awesome and all, yeah. you know, we can edit. That's kind of the key to edit out there. Uh, when you're live on these things, these, I got to hand it to them. These guys do these shows that are live. I don't know with my ums and uhs and oh, getting gosh. off track if I could do it. Yeah. And the occasional F bomb that you drop or the inappropriate joke or <laughs> yeah you know or the slip of the tongue and Whoops. you know <laughs> so yeah i hats off to these guys at nine o'clock um uh, on sunday 9 p.m eastern time uh other side of prepper's path go check check that out uh we're excited to do that too. what time will so, that be in arizona i think we're three hours difference right three now. hours difference so we're looking at about six o'clock about six arizona p.m. time yep so go take a look at that now uh we're, we're going to wrap up the show here, but Nick, um, and I'm actually not going to be there for aquaponics because, uh, endless food systems is going to be there. They're going to have a big booth. Um, and I resell their systems too. Mm. I resell a lot of dif- different systems for aquaponics, but I mix and match and I don't want to try and compete in this venue, but you, you're in March, aren't you doing something? Yeah. The, the, I believe it's the 21st to the 23rd is Prepper Fest, Arizona. And that's at the Arizona State Fairgrounds. And is that Tony that puts that it's on? Tony Tanglos. He's also the host of the Prepper Patch on 1100 AM. Okay. And that's Sundays at 2. Okay. I think. Okay. 1 to 2, I I'll, think. I'll post a show notes. Yeah. I'll post a link up. So you're going to be out there with the bunnies? Yep. I'll be there with the bunnies. Probably we're going to be giving away a solar generator. Oh, really? Yeah. Who's we? Uh, oh, Hostile hair? Yes, Hostile hair. Okay. Sorry, not We Grow Ours this time. Um, Hostile Hair will be giving away a solar generator that is uh, designed to help with the uh, the electricity that your rabbits would need. So are you uh, going to be there TV, alone in the booth? radio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> rabbit ears on the TV. <laughs> rabbit ears. I, I, oh, I, uh, there was a really good recipe posted for rabbit ears the other day. I got to give you. Rabbit ears? Rabbit ears. It looks really good. Yeah. See, that's, that's the part of the rabbit you throw to the dog. I'm yeah, but sorry. you don't need to if you're going to deep fry them. Well, anything deep fried is good. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, on. I saw it. The guy handled the, uh, the replies that he got because he does a lot. Uh-huh. A lot of people, oh, this is disgusting. You're, he says, well, you know, it's no different than eating chickens and I'm just trying to eat every part of the rabbit that I can rather than wasting it. That is, I, I don't have a problem to him. Yeah. I, I, he did a wonderful job with those kind of retaliations and mm-hmm. you're eating cute and fluffy bunny rabbits. So, and y'all know how I handle that. I just like rack the shotgun. I have no remorse. I mean, I raise my animals the way that I see that they need to be raised. They have a good life. They're protected. They eat right. And they're happy. When it comes time, I kill them and eat them and I do it as, as humanely as possible. Right. And I'm sorry, but if you want, you think that you're not accountable for what you eat when you go and you buy it from the store, uh, you're wrong. You're, Absolutely. You're voting with your dollar. So you go into the store and you buy that chicken that's been sitting there for two weeks uh, that was raised in a factory Actually. farm uh, that was snuffed out with uh, bubbly CO2 foam that they're now using to kill mass quantities of chicken. And then they put it in a cooler truck to take it to be defeathered. The process is just getting more and more grotesque. There's and they're stuff- filling them with antibiotics. Oh, yeah. We've gone over this. I yeah, mean, this you is- guys know what you're buying in the store at this point. If yep. you're a listener of this show, you know. If you're not a listener of this show, you should be and you should know already. Exactly. So uh, I believe Scott Yarish, he was a guest yes. on our show, uh, episode three. Yes. Um, he put out a post and – I love him for it. He basically proclaimed that he will no longer be buying meat from the grocery stores. Right. And boom, that's awesome for me. I I think that that's great. 
Yeah. No, and, he, he's doing it from all backyard farmers. And uh, can I plug the, uh, yeah. I just started a Facebook group. My wife had, a, had the idea. It's set up as closed and private right now, though. Yeah, it is right now, but it's Phoenix Backyard Farmers Swap. Um, there's this thing called Swip Swap that my wife does. And, uh, and there's a lot of different, um, backyard farmers. And I'm sure in your city, in your town, in your yeah. states, we'd recommend you do the same thing. Yeah. There's a lot of these things where you can post up and, and buy livestock, goats and chickens and all mm-hmm. this. Um, the twist that we're trying to put on this is want to trade. There you go. Um, so maybe I trade 20 quail for a half a lamb and I can go to another backyard farmer. They get a benefit. I get a benefit. We want to do this so we can start getting that, that barter system in our community together. So I suggest everybody go take a look for that. If there's not one around you, give it a shot. Start one. If you're raising rabbits, you might have enough meat. Throw an extra dough in there and see what you can do with it. Um, Nick sells some amazing cages for that. If you haven't, hostilehair.com. Go take a look at them. You know, get on uh, quail, like Scott said. They're simple to raise. We, right. we've, we've got Justin Rohner that's talking about doing this in your, your yard and gardening. And if nothing else. At yeah, 10 bucks a square foot. Yeah. And, and there's, there's Net. this post going around Facebook about growing a hundred potatoes in a four by four area. I'm sure that's most people have potatoes. seen that. Yeah. So grow some potatoes, if nothing else. And go out and try to barter some of them, eat some of them. I mean, things like this. So. Anyway, March 21st, 23rd. I okay. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so. your booth, uh, you're doing a booth for Hostel Hair. Yes, I am. And who is somebody going to be there with you? Yes, I it's his name is Chris Fry and he's the designer of this uh of this uh solar generator. It's a single panel generator that that will charge cell phones more more useful in a grid down situation would be like a CB radio right. or things of that sort. Um, and I'm, I'm working with him also for a, an AC, an air conditioning unit that's solar powered to bring the, 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 um, the rabbit temperature, yeah, exactly. the temperature in a rabbit. Yeah. I've got enclosure. a new product coming out called the rabbinet, like the rabbit cabinet. Love it. And it's going to have a very small AC unit on there that will have the option of being solar powered. And that's so people in Arizona in the summertime can raise rabbits yeah. and keep them comfortable. For those that don't know, you need to be around 80 degrees for rabbit for rabbits to breed comfortably and effectively. Cool. So, so yeah, come out and meet Nick. I'm sure I'll be there a little bit. Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll do some We Grow Ours interviews out there if I can get away with it, mm-hmm. and uh, at least walk around and and see see what kind of guests we can get. So guys, come out and meet Nick. Hopefully, I'll be there. If not, you get the pleasure of meeting him. So. Yeah, it's very pleasurable to meet me. Yeah, and he's giving away something. So if you're in Arizona, go, yeah, go see stuff. it. Yeah, free stuff. If you're not um, in Arizona, buy a plane ticket. Come out here. Visit us. Well, you know, April 5th and 6th, can they mm-hmm. buy the tickets out there at the March show? We should set that up. Uh, yeah. If nothing else, there will be an electronic way of doing that. Okay, so we'll have tickets available. Mm-hmm. Nick will make sure that we've got tickets available there. So yeah, sure. Uh, you can do that too. So thanks for joining. Do we have anything else we need to talk about? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Suggestions. Uh, suggestions and questions. Please visit the site. Fill us in on what you want to hear. Uh, maybe give us a little crap for what we didn't say when we should have said it. Absolutely. We need to learn. We need to know what you guys Constructive want. Constructive criticism is nice. Being a jerk to us is not so nice, but we understand. Good, good humor, right? <laughs> Expect it back, though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, WeGrowOurs.com slash ask us. WeGrowOurs.com for the website. That has the main player on it. Uh, the blog link has blogs, which Nick and I have to get better at doing. And what's the blog? You can follow, <laughs> you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash we grow ours on Twitter at we grow ours. Um, I'm getting a little tired of this Facebook thing. It, it seems like the reach anymore is just, you got to pay for it. So we're looking for alternatives to that. Mm-hmm. If anybody has some ideas, the, the best way to get out there and reach people, I'm all ears for that. Um, uh, you know, there's Tumblr, there's Google Plus. I haven't really done anything with any of those yet, but if any of our listeners have some, some ideas, I'm, I'm all ears for that. Would love to hear about it. All maybe, of the maybe, other maybe. internet stuff, just type in We Grow Ours and you'll find us. How's that? Yep. There you go. So thanks guys for joining us. Episode six. Wow. Six. Six. Seven. Yeah. Six. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Everything is awesome. Totally spectacular.
Okay. Whatever that was. It's a, it's from the new Legos movie. I haven't seen it yet. My wife and kids saw it. All right. We're still going. Oh, so. okay. We're plugging the pork. Go show them some love. That was disgusting. And you follow up with show them some love. <laughs> <laughs> Edit here. <laughs> <laughs> I cut that end up. It's dead. Yeah.